when one thinks of laws that govern the uh, extraction of mineral oil and gas resources, I sort of think of them as sitting in basically three buckets. The first uh, bucket is the area that I call really the legislated types of agreements. And, and the top one uh, is the first entry point, the exploration license, which is to say the right to go and search for the minerals. In case of a discovery, the next most important one then is the right to mine. In mining is called the mining lease or the mining license, and, and it runs for a specific duration. Embedded in the mining lease will be a suite of things, including, for instance, the royalty tax payment, which is a compensation to the state for merely extracting and selling, regardless of whether the company is or is not profitable. In addition, to that. In the legislative space, especially in today's days where we're dealing with ESG, will be environmental laws. There will be laws on protection of uh, employees and the whole human rights space. That also is legislated, and, and these are what gives the state the power of oversight. This is not necessarily unique to mining, but the laws that govern taxation would also sit in that space, but that's not peculiar to mining. All other corporations are subject to some form of tax. So that, that would be the legislative space. I then see the other area which I call the commercial or, or even uh, the uh, strategic. The commercial really speaks to this. The reason companies search and mine is so they can sell. Without selling, there is no value because this is how they recoup the investment. And in both oil and gas and minerals are what are called offtake agreements. Essentially the right to produce and then sell to a third party. And these agreements also can go for a very long time. But they are important because they have direct bearing on the return on investment. And the combination of the mining lease, the sales agreement, is what convinces bankers and other investors to put money in the project because the first one gives you security of tenure, the second one secures the necessary revenue to give a return. And when one combines these two, you have a value proposition for the potential investor. The third category is what I call opportunistic come uh, strategic on the part particularly of governments. And they vary here, it can be anything. It could be public-private partnerships agreements. It could also be uh, JV arrangements in which the state decides it's going to take equity in the development project. It can also be what is called a production agreement, which is where the state says, not only will I license the company, but I also would like, when you have produced, to take for myself a portion of what is produced and sell it, or do whatever the state may wish to do with the production. In the case of oil and gas, for instance, they might generate uh, revenue in minerals, they might use it for beneficiation. But the truth is that in terms of the types and numbers of agreements, anything is possible. Because when one is dealing with production agreements, there will be a, a particular set of agreements. When one is dealing with equity, there will be joint venture agreements. And, and they sit in a particular area. The important thing when one is thinking about these agreements is, in my opinion, not just that they are there, but that strategically, when you put them all together, what does the state come away with? It's not just the individual contents of each agreement, it is also how when you relate them to each other, they either complement the value that the state is looking for, or for that matter, if they are not structured correctly, 
they could undermine the very value you are seeing. So they have to be synchronized to achieve a particular goal. But also, they have to be ranked in terms of importance based on a country's own development goals. This is particularly true for the strategic and the opportunistic areas. The legislated ones are straightforward. And so it's when we think about agreements, we mustn't look at them as standalone entities. On the contrary, we must look at them as a link in a chain of instruments that the state uses to maximize value.